Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this year's Rhind Lectures, one of the, the high points of the, the Society's activities. And it's uh, very good to see you all here tonight. Um, this year's lectures are sponsored by AOC Archaeology Group, and uh, they're part of the, the Year of Innovation, Architecture and Design uh, 2016. So it's a custom on, on these occasions for the, the president uh, to begin with that with a brief um, memoir of um, Alexander Henry Rind of Sibster, um, who endowed this lecture series. Um, Henry Rind, and I think he, he probably was known to his friends as Henry, was born in 1833, son of Josiah Rind, a banker in Wick, and was educated in the local Pulteney Town Academy at Wick and at Edinburgh University, where he read natural history and natural philosophy. He also attended lectures by Cosmo Innes on Scottish history and antiquities because of his strong personal interest in these subjects. He involved himself in the archaeological study of his native Caithness and in 1851 opened a number of chambered tombs, including those at Yarrow's. In 1853, he investigated the Baroque at Kettleburn, a report on which appeared in Volume 1 of the Proceedings of this Society. The finds from the Baroque were also presented to the Society, Rind having been elected a Fellow in 1852 and uh, becoming an honorary member in 1857, aged only 24. His archaeological interests were far-reaching. For example, in 1851, he made an extended tour in Europe, visiting museums in the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Italy. And he was subsequently called upon to advise the Society on the organization of the exhibits in the Society's museum. Rind had intended to proceed to the Scottish Bar, but in 1853, deteriorating health led him to move to the south of England, and from then on, he only visited Sibster in the summer. Nearly every winter, he went abroad to pursue his antiquarian interests in Egypt, and in later years, spent part of the winter in Spain, Algiers, France, Italy, and Madeira. Rind was a prolific donor of both Scottish and foreign antiquities to the National Museum here in Edinburgh, including many important items he discovered in Egypt. Also in Egypt, he acquired what is now known as the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus, which was sold after his death to the British Museum. The Rhind Papyrus featured in Neil McGregor's History of the World in um, 100 Objects. Rind was an active writer of papers, memoranda, and letters concerning himself, for instance, in matters of antiquities and treasure trove, on which he published influential pamphlets in 1855 on British primeval antiquities, their present treatment, and their real claims, and in 1858 on the law of treasure trove. How can it best be adapted to accomplish useful results. And you remember the Rhine lectures last year uh, looked at these as uh, to underpin a very interesting uh, series of lectures. And we also heard a great deal last year about uh, the importance of his Egyptological uh, work. His magnum opus, uh, the book on his work at Thebes in Egypt, was published in 1862, shortly before his death. And the title of the book being Thebes, its tombs and their tenants, ancient and present, including a record of excavations in the necropolis. Henry Rhine died at Zurich in 1863, some 23 days short of his 30th birthday, and was duly buried in the family burial ground at Wick. Among his many bequests, he was very generous to our society, including the gift of his library of some 1,600 volumes, a sum of 400 pounds for excavation in Northern Scotland, and the profits and copyright of his book in Thebes. In addition, he left the um, eventuated residue of his estate at Sibster to the society to endow the lecture series that still perpetuates his name. And so since this is their inception in 1876, the lectures have enabled speakers to present 
a course of not less than six lectures on some branch of archaeology, ethnology, ethnography, or allied topic in order to assist in the general advancement of knowledge. Um, a fascinating but very short life and a bequest which uh, we have benefited from enormously over the years and for which we are very grateful. And uh, tonight and the next couple of days, um, we have um, Professor um, Roy Sweet from uh, Leicester University um, to give this year's Rhind Lectures. Leicester is a, a fascinating uh, town. It's a place I've had the privilege of visiting quite a few times in recent years. And um, it's remarkable for its uh, discovery uh, of, of a king, uh, for amazing uh, triumphs in sport uh, over the last uh, several days. And now we have the, this amazing opportunity for uh, Professor Sweet to work some of that uh, Leicester uh, magic on us. And uh, we very much look forward to what she has to say. She's a professor of urban history at the University of Leicester and is currently director of the Centre for Urban History and co-editor of uh, Urban History. Her research is focused upon antiquarianism and the reception of the past in the long 18th century and upon urban history during the same period. She is currently uh, extending these interests into the 19th century. Her principal publications include um, the writing of urban histories in 18th century England, uh, published in 1997, the English Town from 1680 to 1840, published in 1999, and uh, antiquaries, the discovery of the, uh, um, the past in 18th century Britain, published in 2004, and uh, Cities in the Grand Tour, the British in Italy, 1690, 1820, 2012. And that, uh, I think, gives you some flavor of uh, what a distinguished uh, guest speaker we have tonight, and uh, why we're so much looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Professor Sweet. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland for the great honour to give these lectures. And it's a great pleasure to be here, and particularly in an environment where I don't actually have to explain what an antiquary is. I should start by making a confession that until I was invited to deliver these lectures, I hadn't actually come across Alexander Henry Rind. This is a reflection not just of my Anglo-centricity, for which I'll probably have cause to apologise again during the course of these lectures, but it also reflects my career-long fixation with the 18th century. Rind was a Victorian, not a Georgian, but as... David's already indicated, I have begun to broach the territory of the 19th century, get altitude sickness occasionally, but I'm sticking with it. But these lectures have given me the opportunity to take forward some of the ideas that I've been thinking about for a long time in the 18th century, and also to make the acquaintance of Rhind. In British archaeology, its progress and demands, he was particularly concerned with the archaeology of prehistory and the law of treasure trove, neither of which I propose to dwell on in these lectures. But he also articulates a number of ideas that are of considerable importance of the antiquaries and archaeologists of the 18th and 19th centuries that I will be discussing. First is his affirmation of archaeological method, although it could equally have been called antiquarian method, that is, systematic comparison and analysis of material remains, the testing of literary sources against such archaeological evidence, and the insistence that this is something that can only be achieved through collaboration and sharing of knowledge on a national scale. Rind also bitterly lamented the neglect of British antiquities on the part of the government, and his hour was particularly focused upon William Hamilton and the trustees of the British Museum for turning down the opportunity to purchase the Fawcett collection of Anglo-Saxon antiquities, preferring instead to focus upon foreign antiquities, which they deemed to be of greater aesthetic merit. <laughs> 
We'll be returning to Fawcett and his antiquities tomorrow, but the point is that for all the diverse range of Rhine's archaeological interests, he was also convinced of the overwhelming importance of a study and preservation of British antiquities. So my theme is antiquaries, architects, and the invention of the historic town or city. I obviously got it wrong in my slide there, never mind, same difference. When I started trying to formulate a rationale for these lectures, I realised that in order to explain where I'm trying to go, I needed first to explain how I got here. So my research interests lie in the fields of antiquarianism, the history of archaeology, occasionally even architectural history, but also in the field of urban history and urban culture. These two strands come together in my interest in the ways in which the past and urban societies have the ways in which past urban societies have engaged with their past, whether in the textual form of writing or through travel and topographical literature or through antiquarian interest in the material fabric of the town. My interests also have more personal roots. I've been drawn to antiquaries and antiquarianism partly out of a curiosity to understand my own relationship to the past. One of the tropes of many antiquaries autobiographical writings is the childhood passion for antiquity. The excitement at finding a Roman coin, being present at a barrow opening, or simply the pleasure of reading history books. That remembered childhood thrill at handling something old is one that continues to resonate. And the question of why I, or you, or any of the antiquaries that I've studied should feel such excitement at a tangible connection with the past, or why individuals or communities have felt so strongly that the remains of the past should be preserved, overriding practical considerations, is one that has always intrigued me. And although I can't claim to answer it, the passionate engagement with and commitment to recording and studying the materiality of the past that antiquaries, archaeologists, and, and architects manifested in this period is culturally significant. So moving beyond solipsistic introspection, my agenda is to understand how such people understood the past, what sense they made of it, how they interpreted it, how they valued it, and why. As a historian, one's trained to be conscious of the traditions and historiographies that have shaped one. Studying antiquarianism has also made me conscious of how one's own perception of the past is to a substantial degree shaped by values and judgments inherited from the 18th and 19th century and is predetermined by the decisions that they took as to what to preserve, what is significant, and what to ignore or destroy. And more specifically, as a historian who's particularly interested in the history of towns and the history of the history of towns, I've become increasingly aware of how decisions taken in the past have predetermined our historic heritage today. This, then, is why I'm interested in antiquarianism. My starting point in thinking about the historic town, however, in this 19th century invention, was the diary of a Colchester watchmaker and small-time antique dealer called William Wire. I don't actually have a picture of William Wire, so I'm giving you a picture of Colchester instead. Um, Colchester, um, sorry, Wire spent most of his time and his limited disposable income on recording and purchasing the material rating, relating to the history and antiquities of his native town of Colchester. He even opened a small museum of antiquities and stuffed birds, celebrated now by Colchester Museum Service as the first public museum in the town. Wire lived for a period when gas mains were being laid, when sewers were being dug, when the city centre was being modernised, suburban expansion taking place, and when the railway came to Colchester, driving a hole through its Roman wall, and in the process, revealing large numbers of antiquities. Wire was interested in any evidence of a town's former state. Although his collecting activity focused on the Roman remains, which are being excavated on a daily basis, he pursued all aspects of the town's history particularly as related to Colchester's role in the Civil War and the story of its defence by the royalist Sir Charles Lucas. He also collected oral testimony from his neighbours, the recollection of a town in former days before the rapid changes that it was undergoing. And his intimate knowledge of the records and history of a town were often called upon by his peers. <laughs> 
So his diary is also a day-by-day -day record of alterations being made to individual buildings, as well as the more general improvement. He described the destruction of a cock and crown public house, the remodelling of church interiors as pews were introduced or new windows created. He noted how street names were changed and how the facade of 15th century houses were altered beyond recognition when their carved brackets and jetties were removed and modernised. He identified fiercely with Colchester and was deeply resentful when the town authorities allowed a tessellated pavement discovered during the construction of a railway to be removed and taken to London, protesting against the spoliation that allowed other museums to be enriched at the expense of Colchester. So why is why interesting? Well, perhaps it isn't terribly interesting for anyone who doesn't live in Colchester or doesn't share my penchant for obscure antiquaries. Nor is he unique. We can find parallels to our in London, in Edinburgh, and provincial towns across the country. But what interested me was the question of how contemporaries reacted to both the unprecedented change going on in the urban environment, particularly from the 1820s, and how they responded to the ever-increasing volume of archaeological evidence that was being revealed, potentially providing so much more information about the earliest history of towns and cities. Reading Wa's diary and his correspondence, it's clear that he saw the history, the antiquities, the heritage, if you like, of Colchester is something that belonged to all the inhabitants of a town. It wasn't the preserve of the elite. Throughout his life, he was engaged in low-level conflict with those who attempted to arrogate to themselves a monopoly over the ownership interpretation of the antiquities that were discovered. On the one hand was the corporation, with an eye on the profits to be made from the sale of antiquities, who threatened contractors with imprisonment if they were to sell why any of the objects they discovered in the course of their work. And on the other hand, he suffered humiliating condescension from many of the gentlemen of the Essex Archaeological Association, who refused to offer him the post of secretary to the society or keeper of a castle museum. His own identity as a craftsman, a Unitarian and a Chartist sympathiser can't have helped him. As he remarked to a friend, aristocracy not of mind but of purse reigns predominant here. Unfortunately, my views on antiquarian matters connected with this town are at variance with the knobs. What struck me as I found out more about War and his circle of antiquaries and archaeologists was the extent to which a new awareness of a town as a historical artefact the outcome of historical processes, a, histor a historical palimpsest, if you like, was being articulated. Towns and cities, or at least in the British case, I would argue, have been underestimated as sites where people have engaged with the past as opposed to engaging with modernity in this period. Modernity is important, but obviously it had to be defined against the past, and it was the rapid displacement of the old with the new that made the contemporaries aware of the value of what was being lost. Approaching the 19th century from the 18th century, this is a very different sensibility from that in the 18th century, which, with, with which I've been more familiar. This, then, was one of my starting points. How did contemporaries and antiquaries respond to the process of change in the urban environment, the archaeological evidence that this revealed, and how did they integrate this into historical understandings of towns and urban space? My other interest, building on earlier work, is the way in which towns presented themselves or were represented by others. Interesting though a character such as William Warr is, there remains the question of how far this antiquarian activity had any bearing on wider society or the towns which were their object of study. Did it actually feed into broader perceptions of towns and the historical development of urban society? And to what extent did this access of historical material and enhanced awareness of the fragility of historic built environment continue to the construction of the historic town as an ideal type? So if we look back to the 18th century, we find that an association of antiquity was routinely invoked in descriptions of towns and cities. It conferred status and legitimacy. It underpinned claims to privilege and autonomy, and it signalled the city's contribution to the narrative of national development. The adjective ancient features in the titles of many histories of towns and cities compiled from the 17th century onwards, 
and was frequently paired with a reference to the town's antiquities. Thus, Philip Morant's History and Antiquities of the Most Ancient Town of Colchester, published in 1748. And in these fat volumes, we find an account of legal and institutional state for the city in former days, but limited reference to the physical appearance of the, t built the town in terms of buildings, streets, and houses. However, by the late 18th century, it's possible to detect a different sense in the usage of the term ancient or historic. Antiquity was increasingly being imbued with a set of aesthetic as well as, his, his, as well as historic associations, which was strengthened by the increasing popularity and available, uh, availability of topographical prints li and literature illustrating typically picturesque antiquities. As a result, the term ancient, when used with reference to a town or city, started to generate expectations of a certain kind of appearance and atmosphere where the remains of antiquity in monuments and buildings were still visible. Thus, the celebration and promotion of a town's ancient historic buildings as a means of attracting visitors was already a feature of topographical literature by the late 18th century as towns began to respond to a quickening pulse of domestic tourism and a fashionable interest in Gothic antiquities. In the 19th century, this trend became increasingly marked as the advent of railways opened up leisure travel to unprecedentedly large numbers of people and stimulated the production of a new range of topographical literature aimed at the railway tourist. By mid-century, there was a cluster of towns which had clearly become established as destinations, chiefly by virtue of their ancient credentials and their antiquities. Amidst the information about the modern city and its amenities, the urban past had also become a commodity that was on display for the visitor. Set-piece descriptions explained exactly what to see and what historical associations should be evoked, and accompanying engravings captured the scene ostensibly for future recollection. More immediately, such images generated a framework of visual imagery through which specific cities came to be seen and inscribed in the collective imagination. By 1860, when railway guides and domestic tourism really began to take off, the use of the term ancient town was less a claim to long-standing privilege than a promise of a particular aesthetic and historical experience which could be strategically exploited by the towns themselves to attract visitors and their custom. So the historic town, as we shall see, was as much a product of domestic tourism as archaeology and antiquarianism. It's of a piece of Victorians' enthusiastic consumption of historical novels, historical paintings, and historical pageants. More importantly, without the value to the concept of a historic town or city that domestic tourism and the commodification of history brought about, the efforts of antiquaries, archaeologists, archaeologists, and architects to preserve some of the antiquities, the houses, walls, gateways, from, etc., from demolition would have been futile. So this opens up another of the strands that I hope to pursue in these lectures. Which buildings and antiquities were preserved and why? The heritage of the historic built environment that has survived today is in some cases serendipitous, but in other cases clearly a consequence of decisions taken actively to preserve buildings in the 18th and 19th century. Our heritage is a product of multiple historical processes, of which the antiquarian movement of the 18th and 19th century is but one. Briefly, I'd like to say something about the periodization of my lectures, partly because one of my colleagues was a bit puzzled. So given my track record to date, the 18th century bit self-explanatory, but why stop at 1860? The easy answer is that the further I go into the 19th century, the more insecure I feel. The second reason is that rather more attention tends to be focused upon the second half of the 19th century when discussing archaeology and also ideas of preservation. Um, archaeologists tend to be more interested in the second half of the 19th century with the adoption of the three-age system, for example, when the British Museum begins to take seriously the collection of British antiquities. And from the point of view of preservation, it's much more interesting because you can talk about Spab, Ruskin, and Morris. But the first half of the 18th century, I would argue, is equally important, if less well-known. And 
Again, urban historians often talk more about the destruction of the 19th century and the destruction of the historic city and the, for the second half of the 19th century. But it's important to remember that up until then, the degree of change in the early 19th century was completely unprecedented. It's the acceleration of urban growth, the introduction of gas mains, of sewers, of water pipes, of railways, transformed the city centers in ways that had never been seen before. And even though the transformations of a later century were even more dramatic at the time, this was completely new and completely transformational. And so the structure of the lectures Today is an introduction, and I want to talk about some of the antiquaries and archaeologists who will feature over the course of the next two days. For those of you who haven't read the pamphlet and, or the leaflet and want to know which ones to avoid, um, tomorrow I will be focusing on the Roman city, the Saxon city, and the question of city walls and fortifications. And on Sunday, I'll be looking at the architecture of olden times, the vernacular architecture of the late medieval and early modern period, and finally, thinking more about heritage and preservation and the construction of this idea of the historic town. So, to move on to the antiquaries, I want to introduce some of the key figures. There are five of them, my famous five, and I'll start with William Stukeley, to whom I feel a close affinity as I grew up opposite Stukeley Close. William Stukeley is probably the 18th century antiquary of whom most people have heard. And even if they haven't heard of him by name, they'll be familiar with the story that Isaac Newton discovered gravity when an apple fell on his head, an anecdote that we owe to Stukeley, who knew Newton as a young man in Cambridge. Stukeley's representative of the early 18th century polymathic predisciplinary world of intellectual inquiry, in which antiquarianism and an interest in all matters relating to the past could sit comfortably alongside mathematical and scientific inquiry. As well as being a physician, Stukeley was keenly interested in optics and astronomy, in theology and philology, and was an amateur artist to boot. He's chiefly remembered today for his contribution to archaeological method. He's one of the few 18th century antiquaries that historians of archaeology tend to deign to notice. His mastery of the science of surveying enabled him to carry out the first scientific surveys of Stonehenge and Avebury, on which my colleagues in the archaeology department still rely. But his powers of observation were also matched with a keen intuitive intelligence. He recognised what crop marks were and was the first to deduce the presence of Roman archaeological remains on their basis. Similarly, he appreciated the importance of stratigraphy in establishing a chronology for finds. On occasion, he also took a more practical, experiential approach to his study of antiquity, informing his friends, John Clark of Pennycook, that as part of his study of the history of hair, he had laid aside wearing a wig, so we see him here with wig and without wig, and would endeavour to show from the practice of the ancients that the fashion of wearing wigs is ridiculous, dangerous to health, and profane. He had, he added, already felt enormous benefits from his new hairstyle. Stukeley's eccentricities were not simply tonsorial and were well known amongst his colleagues. He behaved so cheerfully and with so much civility, reported one friend of a recent visit, that even my wife and sister agreed his oddness is rather amazing than disagreeable. The eccentricities for which he's best remembered today, of course, are his theories surrounding the druidical origins of Stonehenge and Avebury. That's a different story. Stukeley enjoyed mixing of the aristocracy, the Earl of Winchelsea, the Earl of Pembroke, the Duke of Montague were particular friends, and on behalf of Pembroke, he drew up a preliminary catalogue of the Earl's collection of Roman antiquities at Wilton. He had certainly claimed to be a part of a virtuoso culture of a landed elite, but his real interest lay in the antiquities of his own country. He devoted himself for much of his life to recording and describing the antiquities of Britain, not just the druidical monuments, but Roman antiquities and what were then known loosely as Gothic antiquities. He looked on with disfavour as aristocrats, such as those whom he claimed to his friends, travelled abroad and spent vast sums on bringing back antiquities when there's so much to be seen and studied at home. Where else in the world, he asked, had the Romans constructed a monument of a size and grandeur to rank with a Roman wall? Stukeley was far from being a lone figure, but he is representative of a growing community of interests in the first half of the 18th century, who sought to study and record antiquities, particularly pre-Roman and Romano-British, taking inspiration from William Camden's ambition to restore Britain to antiquity and antiquity to Britain. <laughs> 
And Rhind, too, of course, took inspiration from Camden, presenting archaeology as the only means through which it would be possible to move beyond Camden's sphere of remaining strangers in our own soil and foreigners in our own city. Both Stukeley and Camden had a direct and profound influence on my second representative antiquary, Richard Goff. Goff, like Stukeley, had been an undergraduate at Corpus Christi, Cambridge, and like Stukeley, had undergone a kind of antiquarian epiphany when visiting Croyland Abbey in Lincolnshire, which gives me a gratuitous excuse to show you one of my favourite Girton slides, because the picture of Goff is not terribly exciting. Goff didn't like having his picture taken, so... We'll look at um, Croyland Abbey, rather, in preference. Goff also saw him in a tradition of antiquaries going back to Camden, so much so that one of his more notable achievements was to undertake a new translation and revision of Britannia, swelling it to four volumes. I mention this particularly because one of the striking features of 18th century antiquarian culture was the extent to which it was a genuinely collaborative exercise. Antiquaries such as Goff and Stukeley were very much aware of the debt that they owed to their predecessors and that they were contributing a small element of a gradual accretion of knowledge regarding the nation's antiquities. They were keen to share knowledge with all those engaged on the same enterprise. The relatively small world of antiquarian scholarship in the 18th century rendered this the more feasible, and Goff was, if you like, a kind of clearinghouse of antiquarian information. His own anecdotes of British topography and his revisions to Camden were the exemplification of this. Both relied on networks of correspondence to provide him with the necessary information on publications, collections, and the ex existence of antiquities across the country. Like Stukeley, Goff was scornful of those who travelled abroad to Greece and Ionia. This was the age of Reverend Stuart, after all, ignoring the heritage of antiquities in their own country. As a man of considerable wealth, he could easily have undertaken a continental voyage. In fact, he turned down a European tour with John Howard in his youth. Well, his mother made him. But instead, he preferred to travel extensively across the British Isles, collecting antiquarian material and making contact with local antiquaries. In some ways, Goff went against the grain of antiquarianism in the later 18th century, so much so that he resigned from his position as director of the Society of Antiquaries. And to find out why, you'll have to come to the final lecture. But in other ways, he is the best representative of what antiquarian scholarship was about, the Society of Antiquaries was not, in this period, necessarily the best place to look for the state of a field. His interests were chronologically and thematically wide-ranging, but, as I said already, he's best known today as a compiler and editor. The anecdotes, the Britannia, sepulchral monuments, but he also brought to completion a wide range of other publications, showing a remarkable willingness to assist other scholars for the greater good of antiquarianism. He worked very much in the empirical tradition of Francis Bacon, who spoke of the project to recover the shipwreck of time through empirical observation. And he would have been very much at one with Sir Richard Colt Hoare's famous dictum, we speak from facts, not theory. In one of his earliest forays into print, he cut his critical teeth, pulling Stukeley's tendentious reasoning in the latter's dissertation on the coins of Carousius to pieces. He railed against the hypothetical approach which Stukeley employed and drew on the 18th century Englishman's abhorrence of overarching systems and theories, labelling it the systematic fatality of the age. Antiquaries of all people, he wrote, should be the most averse to substituting fancy and invention to that fiction and obscurity they labour to banish. He also had a little time for the historians and philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment, people, he said, who affected to set grammar and morals in a new light without the least concern about the history of past ages. They were prudes in divinity, metaphysicians in philosophy, novices in philology, and they aspired above the roots of antiquarian science. Another of his targets were those who saw local history simply as a sop to family pride, filling the pages of a county history with lengthy pedigrees and plates of gentry seats. Incorrect pedigrees, futile etymologies, verbose disquisitions, crowds of epitaphs, lists of landholders, and such farrago thrown together without method 
unanimated by reflections, and delivered in the most uncouth and horrid style, make the bulk of our county histories. This was a problem because he was convinced of a genuine importance of a knowledge of antiquities for the good of society, and such publications compromise the credibility of antiquarian scholarship. But he was equally dismissive of those who compromise scholarly content in favour of making a volume more readable. He was a man who appreciated the value of a good footnote, not so much for the opportunity it offered for Gibbonian subversive irony, but because it enabled the reader to see where information had been derived from and how conclusions had been reached. Without them, the best written history or narrative will forever bear the air of a pleasing novel. He admitted to being too much of a sour-headed antiquary. Certainly, his letters don't sparkle with aphoristic wit or delight in personal absurdity, which makes Walpole so entertaining, but they do have a certain trenchant and forthright charm. Walpole, for his part, found Goff unpardonably dull. Mr. Goff is apt, as antiquaries are, to be impatient to tell the world all he knows, which unluckily is much more than the world is at all impatient of hearing. <laughs> The other point that I think is important to remember about Goff is the value that he placed both upon the non-textual evidence of the past, architecture, sculpture and art, and the importance of a visual record as a mode of study, facilitating comparison, and a means of preserving a record. Not that he believed that a visual image in itself was sufficient to compensate for the loss of the original. He uttered dire warnings to the readers of sepulchral monuments. Soon the foundations for such a work would no longer be in existence. Statues were crumbling away, war paintings were disappearing under coats of whitewash, and valuable antiquities were being allowed to fall into neglect and dissolution. And because of his emphasis upon the visual, Goff was also an important patron of some of the best draftsmen of his day, some of whom will feature in subsequent lectures. Joseph Strutt was an early find of his, Jacob Schneberly another, and perhaps most importantly in terms of the themes of these lectures, John Carter. These artists turned antiquary, of which were many more, are a very important and perhaps underappreciated group of people in the history of antiquarianism and appreciation of the built heritage. The quality of their engravings, and Carter's in particular, did much to raise the profile and reputation of the buildings which they depicted. Artists who studied buildings, or in Strutt's case, manuscripts, um, became self-taught experts. Carter, notably in the um, case of Gothic architecture, and in the early 19th century, his writings represent some of the most vocal articulations for the importance of preservation to be found anywhere. Unlike Goff and Stukeley, these were not men educated by private tutors, nor were they graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, nor did they have private means on which to draw. Carter was the son of a marble carver and a sculptor. Schneberly, the son of an artist, struck the orphan son of a miller. Like William Wire, who I mentioned earlier, they were largely autodidacts. And just as Wire's interest was a part of his business, watch menders frequently operated a sideline as dealers in coins, for these men too, antiquities and antiquarianism were both a passion and a means of subsistence. Antiquarianism was not for them a recreation or a dilettante pursuit, and nor was it the prerogative of the gentlemanly or landed elite who subscribed to the county histories. Domestic antiquities in their hands were a part of the inheritance of any Englishman or Briton. And for all that the Society of Antiquaries regularly blackballed candidates who'd been in trade, including Carter, there is an interestingly democratic streak implicit in the study of domestic antiquities as the birthright of the nation at large. And another one who would subscribe to this point of view is John Britton, who was the next generation. Like Carter, he was, if you like, a career antiquary in that he created a professional persona for himself and earned a living for a lifetime of publishing books on Britain's antiquities. He claimed to have been barely literate when he left school at 13. He then worked in the cellars of the Jerusalem Tavern in Clerkenwell. By the 1790s, he was working as a solicitor's clerk by day and attending debating societies and performing dramatic monologues by night. Around the turn of the century, he discovered the picturesque and the study of antiquities. By 1800, he was embarked upon a major publishing project with Edward Braley, the Beauties of England and Wales, and this was to be the first of many ambitious undertakings, including a series on England's cathedrals and a history of Gothic architecture. <laughs> 
a series on picturesque antiquities of English cities, and of course, his study of Edinburgh, modern Athens. And in total, over 80 books have been credited to his name. In his engaging but self-aggrandizing autobiography, Britain was highly critical of the antiquarian publications of his day, particularly on the grounds that they were unreadable. Too much recondite learning, too many Latin and Greek inscriptions, too many pointless lists. They were uninteresting, unattractive, and poorly illustrated. Britain set out to change that. He produced volumes that were intended to sell, and as such, they were written in a more accessible style without compromising on antiquarian content, and they were, above all, well illustrated. As an amateur artist of reasonable ability himself, he employed what can only be described as a dazzling roll call of artists and engravers in his projects. He had learned from Goff and Carter the value of the visual image as a record and as a means of furthering the analysis of architectural antiquities. Britain was never slow to blow his own trumpet and took for himself a fair amount of credit for having started the Gothic revival through his publications. What he did do, and what is important for the theme of my lectures, is that through his publications, he strengthened the connection in the public's mind between the picturesque and a wide range of Gothic antiquities, not just cathedrals. He helped to educate the reading public towards a rather more discriminating understanding of Gothic architecture and its different styles. And through his national surveys, he brought to wider attention a huge range of buildings of historic interest that had not been so, had not been so categorized previously, including, as we shall see, many in towns. In the course of his long career, Britain's own commercial and antiquarian interests can be hard to disentangle. What started out initially as a means of making money became also a personal crusade. He used his volumes to utter strictures on those who damaged or destroyed ancient buildings. As we shall see, he campaigned with a radical MP, Joseph Hume, for legislative intervention in the preservation of antiquities. And he gave evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee on National Monuments and Works of Arts in 1841. His career was exceptionally long. Born in 1771, he only died in 1857, and as such, he spans two very different worlds of antiquarian scholarship. In the last decade of his life, he was also an active member of the Royal Archaeological Institute. During his lifetime, antiquarianism had become far more profitable and far more popular than might have seemed possible in an earlier generation, and had become much more closely associated with a burgeoning sense of national identity and national, national history. But the Royal Archaeological Institute, of which he was a member, was, of course, a breakaway society from the British Archaeological Association, founded in 1844. The membership profile of these two societies and the reasons for the split would be the subject of a lecture in itself. It's not important now. Rather, I want to focus upon two of the founder members of the British Archaeological Association, who were also key players in that split and who will be key players in these lectures, Charles Roach Smith and Thomas Wright. <coughs> Now, it'd be wrong to say that Charles Roach Smith has been forgotten. Any account of archaeology in London mentions him as the key figure of the 19th century, the pioneer rescue archaeologist, the man who stood up against the vested interests of a corporation, and the man who fought for the better representation of British antiquities at the British Museum. But few studies actually evaluate him on his own terms in the context of antiquarian and archaeological activity and thought at the time. Like William Stukeley, Roach Smith is generally discussed by archaeologists who are looking for stepping stones on the path to a modern scientific approach to archaeology or for the evidence that he provides on particular excavations. Less important is the cultural and intellectual world in which he operated. But Roach Smith is very interesting in terms of what he thought archaeology was about and how one went about it. He's less disarmingly enthusiastic than Stukeley, but he did share Richard's Go Richard Goff's inability to suffer fools gladly and utter conviction in the social and cultural value of what he was about. He was born on the Isle of Wight, youngest of ten children, and trained as a chemist. His early antiquarian interests were fueled by reading John Pinkerton on coins, and he bought his first coins when apprenticed to a chemist from someone who'd recently discovered a hoard. <coughs> 
His antiquarian enthusiasm was further stimulated by the discovery of a Roman altar in Chichester and a visit to the recently excavated Roman villa at Bigna. In his autobiography, he declared, a new world seemed opening to me, and I now began with some method to study not only remains similar to those at Bigna, but Roman history, and Gibbon's decline and fall of a Roman empire I at once procured, read, and reread. Bigna represented a villa in its entirety. It could be imaginatively reconstructed. It offered a different way of thinking about the ancient world and a possibility of reconstruction to which I'll be coming back to tomorrow. Smith's devotion to decline and fall is also interesting in the light of his subsequent career because it was the period of decline and fall at the edge of empire that particularly interested him and in the terms of the transition of Roman Britain and Saxon Britain. Britain. In 1827, he moved to London and set up business in Lothbury. In his diary for that year, he recorded that he had been reading Camden and noted the latter's choice to remain single apprehending that the encumbrances of a married life might prove a prejudice to his studies. Fortunately, he was able to rely upon his unmarried sister to keep house for him. He was a daily witness to the changes that were going on in the wake of urban improvement, taking notes, purchasing what he could, patrolling the excavations, and going out to the dredgeman as the foundations for New London Bridge were laid. At Lothbury, he fell foul of railway development and the Corporation of London brought him out through compulsory purchase. So he moved to Liverpool Street. Then in 1856, he retired and moved to Strood in Kent, where his interests drifted away from Roman archaeology to Shakespeare and Stratford. And viticulture, which does have an antiquarian angle. There's a lot of debate about whether the Romans or Saxons introduced vines, but that's a different story. I digress. Rose Smith was a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, eventually. Initially, he was blackballed on the grounds of being in trade. Of course, Society of Antiquaries of London has, was always far less enlightened than the Scottish Society of Antiquaries in terms of membership. His primary identity was as an archaeologist rather than an antiquary. For H. Smith, the term antiquary betokened uncritical, fanciful approaches which he associated with the 18th century. It's not a wholly accurate representation, but to be fair, by the later 18th century, membership of the Society of Antiquaries reflected one's social position rather than antiquarian credentials. And this continued into the 19th century when he was particularly critical of their inertia and the poor quality of the papers in archaeologia. His disappointment of the Society of Antiquaries and his awareness of what was being achieved in France encouraged him in pressing with others for the foundation of the British Archaeological Association, although he fell out of that society too in later years. He was not, one senses, an easy man to work with, and his privately published recollections takes no prisoners when it comes to identifying the shortcomings of his fellow antiquaries and archaeologists. Like Stukeley and Goff, and of course Rind, he was deeply disappointed at the neglect of domestic antiquities. And this was of a piece of a wider critique of a government's disregard for national monuments of all kinds. Having been closely involved in the abortive attempt to sell the Fawcett collection to the British Museum, he felt this particularly acutely. But it's not just the British Museum. He is a very strong supporter of local museums, insisting, for example, that antiquities found in Chester or Colchester should stay there rather than being sent to London, and that local museums should display local antiquities rather than random Assyrian or Greek ones, because archaeological objects, he argued, derive their meaning from the context in which they were found, and to deracinate them from their locality was to render them worthless. My final famous five was Thomas Wright. Was not an autodidact, but he was precocious. While still at school and aged only 17, he completed volume five of Thomas Allen's History and Antiquities of London, and a schoolmaster paid for him to attend Cambridge, where he made a number of formative friendships, including the Anglo-Saxon scholar J.M. Kemble. At this time, he's also contributing articles to The Gentleman's Magazine and other periodicals and undertook a revision and expansion of Morant's History of Essex. What's interesting is that a young man who would always have known that he would have to make his own way chose to apply himself to antiquarianism at such an early age. It says something about the ubiquity of antiquarianism as a mode of study and an occupation that is easily forgotten today. And it's also indicative 
of its wider, accept, the wider acceptance of its relevance to society, despite the caricatures that were so readily drawn of it. Given his friendship with Kemble, it should be no surprise that he was a Teutonist, although less extreme than someone like Freeman or Kingsley. He was very much an urban liberal, and thanks in part to his French wife, was very much in touch with developments in French antiquarianism and archaeology, like Roach Smith. But unlike Smith, he was a joiner and founder of societies. He was a founder member of the Camden Society, the Percy Society, the Shakespeare, the Caxton, the Historical Society of Science, the Numismatic, the Ethnological, as well as a host of archaeological and antiquarian societies in Britain and, br and abroad, including the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres. Not simply because he was clubbable, but because he could see the interrelationship between the different branches of inquiry. The only area where he doesn't display any real interest was in Gothic architecture, possibly a reflection of his Quaker background, although with so much other expertise in this area, perhaps it's not a surprise that he chose not to invest in it. Mike Smith, Wright saw himself as a scientist in archaeology and ethnology, but he tends to be remembered today for his outright rejection of the free age system and his stand, um, steadfast belief in the... Um, value of the itinerary of Richard, and, Richard of Sirencester, um, a forgery perpetrated by Stukeley in the 18th century. And his most widely read, read text was the Celt, the Roman, and the Saxon, in which both these principles are upheld. And for this reason, he tends to be looked upon rather unfavorably by historians of archaeology, and he's almost entirely ignored by other scholars, despite the importance of his work at Utexeto Uriconium, where he led the excavations in the 1860s. I think it's actually more interesting to consider why he refused to accept the argument for free ages in spite of so much evidence to support it, but again, that's a different lecture. Uh, he's also criticised for his inaccuracies and his rather slapdash editing, and certainly the speed at which he worked wasn't conducive to consistently high standards of scholarship. But he is very interesting as a representative of a broad range of antiquarian scholarship at the time. And because of the bewildering, diverse range of his interests, the constant pressure to publish um, was a reflection of his own need to earn a living. Uh, Wright never had private means, and therefore he spent his entire career desperately trying to produce publications that would earn a bit of money. And so this is part of what drives him to embrace anthropology, history of art, including history of caricatures, literary history, the history of science, philology, archaeology. He would turn his hand to anything. So he, he represents a continuation of a kind of polymathic, predisciplinary um, inquiry that we saw with William Stukeley and is continuing it into the 19th century. So this urge to publish was partly a desperate strategy for earning money and in his correspondence with various patrons uh, it really is he really is um, living from hand to mouth. But Wright also believed very firmly in the importance of communicating a knowledge of history and antiquities to society at large. Like others of his generation, he was convinced that a knowledge of history and antiquities would lead to a better appreciation of them, which in turn would help to ensure preservation, a uh, principle which still underpins, of course, the ethos of historic England. It's also clear from his writings that he believed the preservation of more intangible antiquities handed down from the past, such as political liberty or just civilization more broadly defined, was dependent upon historical study. Making such knowledge available to the reading public and in a form that was attractive and accessible, and his works were always beautifully published, um, beautifully illustrated, with, very, with a lot of woodcuts by his friend Fairholt. This was, in effect, his life's work. He saw the appetite for works of history and antiquarian scholarship that, had been, that was being fostered in historical novels. Uh, he was a friend of both Harrison Ainsworth and Bulwer-Lytton. And the emergent market for armchair and domestic tourism, which John Britton's publications, for example, had begun to encourage. Wright took this further and aimed not just at the middling market, but also at the literate working classes for readership of periodicals such as the Penny Magazine or the recipients of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. <laughs> 
Charles Knight, who did more to popularise illustrated histories than anyone else in this period, was a close friend and collaborator. And much of the content of Knight's publications can be traced back to Wright and other members of Wright's network. The split with the BAA was due, in part at least, to Wright's decision to publish of his own initiative an account of the Society's Winchester Congress and a selection of articles based on the papers there in the archaeological album, which he deliberately aimed at a non-specialist readership. Wright realised that what people wanted was history to which they could relate, and in particular, a history of domesticity, everyday life, manners and customs, the role of women within the family, in effect, a social history of the English people. I finish on right because he, remem- he represents several themes which are central to all my lectures. Firstly, his eclecticism. In ranging from the Romans to the 17th century, I feel, my- I feel myself in good company with Wright, if overawed by the breadth of his learning and his industry. Second is the emphasis upon a history of domesticity. This emergent interest and its importance in terms of evaluating the study of the urban past will be a theme throughout these lectures. Third is Wright's belief in the importance of communicating to a wider readership a knowledge of their own history, partly for commercial reasons, it is true, but also because such communication was essential in gaining acceptance for their firmly held belief for the relationship between history, heritage and the public good. Thank you.